Happy spring, everybody. Great to see you. I am Toolman Tim. Welcome to Liquid Church. Welcome our campuses around New Jersey or church online. Welcome to our brand new series, Fixer Upper. Now, quick show of hands. How many of you have seen the show? on HGTV, okay, yeah. So this is a, a home renovation show, like Property Brothers or, or Flip This House, that kind of thing. And, uh, and so, so today, it's very exciting because you came to church. We are going to shiplap everyone's home uh, in this church. Some of you are like, what's shiplap? Oh, you'll find out. Uh, what's special about this, uh, this cable show, Fixer Upper, is that I think the stars of the show are this charming couple known as uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines. Uh, lovely couple, they got four kids, happily married, they're actually committed Christians. And Chip's kind of like the fun-loving dad, you know, who is the, uh, the home contractor. And then Joanna is the interior designer. And together, they specialize at taking these kind of old, dilapidated, dumpy, fixer-upper houses, renovating, rebuilding, transforming the space. And if you've watched the show, you know how it always begins, right? Chip and Joanna, they always show some couple three homes for sale, usually in Texas, each of which requires, you know, repair or renovation. It's a fixer-upper. And then once the couple picks their house, Chip does the demo, right, while De De Joanna designs it. So it's like a combination, like his construction expertise and her creativity. And the first thing they do, of course, is make a mess, right? They kind of rip out the guts, tear down the drywall. They rip down beams and everything. It always gets worse before it gets better. And then Joanna brings her kind of magic wand to the thing, and really it's incredible, transforming a mess. Like, here's a picture, okay? This is the space before but here's the kitchen after, okay? So isn't that what your DIY project looks like at home, right? Just I always like that, right? Super elegant, um, you know, gorgeous design, but Joanna's signature element is using a shiplap in her decorating, which is just kind of a, a wooden slat board that's usually used for exterior siding, but she like, when it, she, she shiplaps bedrooms, you know, kitchens, living rooms, when in doubt, chuck a little shiplap on there, voila, transformation. Now, the fun part of the show is that this total renovation is done kind of in secret, right? The homeowners don't see what the rehab looks like until the big reveal. That's when the Chip and Joanna kind of bring them out. They stand in the street, they close their eyes, and then they wheel this giant photo of their house, you know, before the reno, then pull it away to reveal the final product, right? Which is always amazing. This dumpy, dilapidated little fixer-upper becomes this super charming home that's elegantly appointed. And the show is a runaway hit. It's in its fourth season, and it has become Cable's most watched reality show. Over three million viewers an episode. And honestly, I think the secret is Chip and Joanna. They kind of come across just as normal, ordinary, you know, everyday people. They're genuine, they're humble, they're authentic, kind of friends you'd hang out with. And they kind of have this, like, amazing chemistry, you know, where Chip's goofiness kind of balances out Joanna's drivenness. And they, they, they get work done, but they have a lot of fun doing it. In fact, here's a quick clip that captures their chemistry. You take it around the corner and you could add a pool one day, you could do all her raised bed gardens, you could lock Chip up in the dirty little storage shed that's in the back and never let him out. Great. Hey, when I stand like this, do I look really strong or do I look kind of fat? <laughs> because I was just standing here and I can feel the buttons sort of bulging He's open. It's like Superman. Like, but that's what boom. I'm saying. Is it like, wow, look at that guy. He kind of looks jacked. Jacked. Or are you I thinking, thinking that jacked. guy's a little chunky to be standing that way? <laughs> jacked. Of course jacked. The goalies ended up going with the tire swing house, which... Hold on one second, I've got to kiss this little one. Hello, little girl. <laughs> You're being so quiet. You're being so quiet. Okay, shh. Psst. The goalies... Shh! Hey! Oh. That's I thought good. you were going to be like, shiplap, a shiplap, a shiplap, a shiplap. Like you do on all the other houses. Shiplap, shiplap. <laughs> You know, although Chip and Joanna like to laugh, they are committed Christians. They're followers of Jesus who take their faith pretty seriously. In fact, right now I'm reading their book, uh, The Magnolia Story, which uh, tells about their first reno project and then the real-life drama behind the scenes. And it's interesting because their story isn't without hardships. Their first fixer-upper, uh, you know, not everyone was a success. They made some mistakes along the way. In fact, Joanna had to close down her dream business uh, and then focus on raising the kids. So this is real life stuff. And, and the book's about how, how in many ways life itself is a fixer-upper. And that's what this series is about. Fixer-upper, our sermon series, is about a book in the Bible that describes a renovation project. In fact, it's the biggest construction project you'll see in Scripture. It's about rebuilding something 
that's been broken down. And that book is called Nehemiah. Can everyone say that? Nehemiah. Yeah, it's the name of a guy in the Old Testament who led this kind of miraculous makeover, this renovation project in human history. He saw the walls of the city um, of God, Jerusalem, were, were broken down. They were dilapidated. They were falling apart. And with God's help and the Holy Spirit's power, he performed a fixer-upper. He completely transformed his world. In 52 days, Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem for the glory of God and the good of his people. And it's an amazing story. So in this series, I'm going to be asking you a question. And here it is. Ready? What's broken in your world that needs fixing? Because we all have a fixer-upper in life, right? Like, we all have something that's kind of falling apart or maybe needs a little TLC, you know, maybe it's a relationship in your life that needs repair, or you're like, my marriage could use a makeover, right? Uh, maybe your finances have fallen apart. <laughs> you're like, I got to dig out of debt and rebuild our bank account. Or you need to rebuild your career after a layoff or, or, uh, or your body. Maybe you've let your health kind of slide, you know, and you're like, I got to get the walls back up this spring, you know? Or there's just a broken situation in your family, you know, with your kids or, or, or your parents that's kind of fallen apart and it needs re rebuilding. I'm talking real life here, not reality TV. Because um, that's the interesting thing about this church, if you're new. We're trying to be real life. And um, at this church, I know that right now, that at every campus, there are people listening who are facing real life rebuilds. I'm, um, I'm thinking of a widow that I know. And of all the things that she imagined for herself, she never dreamed that she'd be alone at this point. Because her husband was, was, was 58 when he had the heart attack. And now she, she's alone, and the house is really, really quiet. And that's, it's just hard right now, because she, they had a lot of friends, but so many of, you know, her friends were, were their friends, and, and, and so she has this new reality of rebuilding a life, life after his death. And, and it's confusing. She has all these questions, like, you know, do I, do I sell the house? Uh, do I stay in the house? Do I, um, do I stay single? Or do I, do I date? Like, do I even know how to date, right? She's 52. I mean, she's, she's smart, she's strong, she's capable, but she's alone. And she's rebuilding a life after his passing, party of one. And she feels a little lost about where to start. I mean, let's be honest. Situation like that, there's no blueprint for rebuilding, is there? I mean, where do you begin? I'll give you another example, different, different story. Um, I'm thinking of a couple and it's 2007, and their careers are rocketing. Both, you know, great trajectory. They both uh, work in the city, great jobs, great income, great couple. And in 2007, they actually move into their dream home. That kind of stretches them a bit because it's a little bit more than they can afford financially. But, you know, they have faith. It's in line with where their, their incomes are going to go. But it's 2007. Fast forward four years, it's now 2011. And not only did their careers plateau, but then the market bottomed out. And his company was downsized. And the money they anticipated did not come in. And they had to go through the pain of saying goodbye to their dream home that they lived in for four years. They had, they had to sell it. And now it's 2017. And they're still digging and rebuilding their financial world from the ground up. You understand, this, these aren't just like issues of money. This is about dreams. This is about self-confidence and, and doubt. And all the emotions that crash in our world whenever you or I experience any kind of implosion or demolition of dreams in life. And we have to start rebuilding the walls from the ground up. We're like, I... See, in a broken world, guys, where things don't go as planned, I believe every single person listening to me right now will experience one moment in your life where you will find yourself rebuilding. Rebuilding a relationship, rebuilding a family, Rebuilding a career, rebuilding a life. It's, it's like a fixer-upper. And at that moment, people often wonder, they're like, where do I begin? How do I even start? It's like doing a reno without a blueprint. Enter Nehemiah. <laughs> See, your father in heaven loves you so much, he doesn't leave you guessing. He gives us the book of Nehemiah, which provides a blueprint for rebuilding your broken world. That's actually the subtitle of our series. Rebuild your world in 52 days. Now, some of you are like, 52 days? That's impossible. You're right. <laughs> with man, it is impossible. But the Bible says, with God, all things are possible. Amen? 
So we're going to open our Bibles now and kind of look at God's blueprint. And if you have a Bible, you can just kind of open that up or flip there in your phone to chapter one of Nehemiah. Now a little bit, Nehemiah is located in the Old Testament. In fact, it's right before the book of Psalms. And so it's sandwiched. You may have to look at the table of contents because it's a hard booger to find. It kind of goes Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. So it's sandwiched in here. And what we're going to do is for the next few weeks, we're going to read through the first six chapters of Nehemiah's story. And I really believe this could change your life. Because when you have like the courage, the, the strength to take on a fixer-upper, and then you have the humility of asking God for help, that's when transformation happens. Because it's one thing to like renovate an old farmhouse in West Texas, right? It's a lot harder to reno an entire life. But Nehemiah is going to show us how step by step. So I want to read this together. Nehemiah chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 1. Let's read it out loud, and then we'll pause, and I'll kind of break it down for you, okay? Verse 1 of Nehemiah says this. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. Now, Hakaliah is the brother of Hakalugi, okay? So just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just let, follow me here, okay? I just want to flag for you. <laughs> There's going to be some super weird names and stuff in here. Don't get thrown off. Just follow, okay? In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. Now, let's just pause here, all right? Give you a little history so you can kind of understand the backstory. This is one of the, 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 the uh, you know, you turn here in the Bible and you start reading, you're like, I don't I have no idea what this is. Let me just help, I'm going to break this down it's super easy. Two words I'm going to give you to hold on to, ready? The first word is ruin, and the second word is return, all right? The book you're reading, Nehemiah, was written in 445 BC. So this is 400 years before the birth of Jesus. And at this moment, Jerusalem, that's the capital city of God's people. This is where the temple of God is located. It is literally in ruins. It's broken down. Why? According to history, in 587 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army attacked Jerusalem and burned it to the ground. Why'd that happen? Answer, because God's people, the Israelites, had turned their backs on God. They actually rebelled. They said, we're going to worship other gods, other idols, and the judgment was severe. God allowed the Babylonians to come in and basically just wipe out Jerusalem. The Babylonians tore down the walls. They ransacked the temple. They burned people's homes. And then they led God's people away in chains to Babylon. See, Nebuchadnezzar actually had a policy of deportation. Whenever the Babylonians conquered an enemy, he enslaved them and shipped them off to Babylon. And that's where most of the Jews were living at this time. They're in exile. They're deported. They're in captivity. Now watch. Fast forward. 50 years. Here we go. Another king comes to power. His name is Cyrus the Great. He's actually the king of Persia. That's modern day Iran. He's the global dominant superpower. And the Persians attacked the Babylonians and beat them. But Cyrus had a different policy. He said, I'm going to let the Jews return to their homeland. You guys can go home. But guess what? Not a lot of them did. This is 50 years after the original exile. So by now, uh, Jewish families, like their kids are going to school there. They've got businesses in Babylon. They're, 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 oh, so only a small group actually returned to Jerusalem. That little group was called the remnant. It's like a carpet remnant. It's the leftover piece at the end. When they return to Jerusalem, they find the city in ruins. It's broken down. So Nehemiah, who is living in Persia at this point, says, how's it going? How, what's happening with the remnant back home? Verse 2, I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great what? What's this word? Trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have what? Been burned with fire. Translation, how's Jerusalem? Answer, it's a train wreck. Jerusalem is a disaster. Nehemiah, the walls, they're broken down. The gates are burned. This is, bro, it's not a fixer-upper. This is a disaster. It's a disgrace. Guys, understand, the walls of God's people had been broken down for 140 years. That would be like saying the walls of America have been broken down since the late 1800s. It was humiliating. 
Because without walls, God's people were vulnerable to attack. They are unprotected. The temple is in tatters. Their homes are falling apart. And at this moment, Israel's enemies are like, oh my gosh, look at you guys. That's pathetic. This is how like your mighty God lets his people live? In a broke down city with broken gates and broken homes? You're pathetic. Israel, your God is pathetic. And what's interesting is Nehemiah's response in verse 4. It says, when I heard these things, I sat down and what? I wept. What do you do when someone you love, you learn that their world is falling apart? What do you do when you discover your son or daughter is binge drinking? Right? Or, or taking drugs? Or, or you hear close friends are getting a divorce? You, you went out to dinner with them last month. You had no idea. Some part of their world is imploding. The walls are coming down. According to Nehemiah, step number one, you let the grief in. You actually let the pain touch your heart. Jerusalem's walls are broken, and Nehemiah is broken hearted. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. He lets it deeply into his soul. If you're taking notes, this is the first step in any spiritual renovation according to Scripture. If you're going to rebuild your world, you can't just say, oh, that's broken. I'm going to grab a hat and put some shiplap on that junks. You can't do it. Today, Nehemiah is going to tell us, here's the foundational steps that any believer must take if they're going to change their world for good. And the first thing we learn is that leaders who change the world first sit down to cry. This is the first step of a fixer-upper. You guys know what this thing is? Do you know what this thing is? Do you know what this thing is? It is. It is a nail gun. And I was like, let's have a little bit of drama here because I'm like, I'm going to build a wall. I'm going to show that I am a manly man. Are you ready? Here we go. First step is going to sit down and cry. <laughs> Some of you are like, you hit your finger. You're going to cry, man. This is going to be. Can I have a hand for that? That is some serious action right there. When Nehemiah sees the broken down walls, he says, I sat down and I wept. He did the very thing Jesus did when he walked into Jerusalem and he saw his people being oppressed. Jesus said, they're like sheep without a shepherd. There's no one to care or protect them at all. And Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Notice it's not crying, it's weeping. There's a difference, isn't there? This isn't like a baby cry. This isn't like, oh, boo-hoo. Nehemiah says, I wept. Weeping is like an ugly cry, right? Ladies, you know what it's like, what I'm talking about, right? Ladies, right, you ugly cry, you know what that looks like. U-G-L-Y, you ain't got no alibi. There's mascara coming down. The makeup's coming off. You got snot flinging, you know, and you're sobbing. <laughs> Guys do this too, okay? We just, you know, kind of go in the bushes. But Nehemiah, he's so overcome that he sits down and he just sobs and sobs and sobs. Not for himself, but for people he loved. So let me ask again, what's broken? in your world, that breaks your heart. I mean, it may be intensely personal. You know, the other week when people came forward for healing prayer, one woman said, Tim, my son is hooked on heroin. She started blinking like this, and I realized she was blinking back the tears. She said, if I let the reality of that sink in, I will fall apart. I will, I will literally collapse right here in the fetal position, and I will not get up. Another person said, um, Pastor, would you pray for my marriage? We've been married 12 years, but it's like we're strangers. There's no intimacy. We're not on the same page. Even the kids feel it now. It's, it's painful to admit. It makes me want to cry. Nehemiah shows us that the first step to actually changing your world is to face reality head on. And you have to be willing to sit down and cry. That is, you don't just push away the pain. You actually let it touch your heart. Now, guys, this is not a bad thing, okay? This is not a weak thing. Don't be afraid of this because some of you are like, oh, what's that going to do? Just crying and sadness, all that. Listen, understand, Nehemiah is not a weak man, okay? He is a courageous, strong leader. He has an entire book of the Bible written about him. But for Nehemiah, his grief and his heartache becomes the catalyst, the launching pad for rebuilding his broken world. See, emotion is powerful especially when it is aimed against writing something that's wrong. Some of you listen to Dave Ramsey. You guys know Dave Ramsey? 
financial guru. He like tells families how to do a budget, how to get out of debt. Dave Ramsey's from the South. And uh, I've heard him say before, if you want to get out of debt, first step, you got to get good and angry. And in other words, Ramsey says, before people make the commitment to get out of debt, first they need to get angry. Why? Because the gravitational pull of apathy (laughs) is so strong, like just doing nothing, limping along from bill to bill. People spend decades ignoring that pain. But Ramsey's like, then you're going to hit the tipping point. And someone gets angry, and they go through the bills, and they finally say, this is crazy. We can't go on living like this. He says, and that's when it happens. All of a sudden, they start to change these deeply ingrained habits. They stop going out to eat all the time. All of a sudden, you start selling stuff in the house. You know, anything that's not nailed down, like we're selling it, you know? Even the dog starts, like, looking real nervous, right? It's kind of like, what? (laughs) The, the, The tax refund comes. But instead of, you know, blowing it on a vacation, you actually use it and pay off one of your bills. And Ramsey says it often takes that moment of emotional clarity, this tipping point, when something breaks and the brokenness of it touches your heart and catalyzes you into radical action. Those of you who struggle with drinking, this is the second DUI, right? The first one was expensive. first one was embarrassing, but it wasn't enough to get you to change. Now the second one, though, is the wake-up call. It changes everything. Because now driving privileges, work routines, everything's changed. And guys, this is a gift from God. It's a gift from God. Because sometimes God allows something highly disruptive in our lives to jar us out of a rut we're in and wake us from our apathy. And and, and you feel the brokenness at a heart level and you finally cry out, I'm sick of living like this. And you finally muster the courage to go to that church on Monday night and walk down into the basement with that awkward circle of chairs and stand there before strangers and say, my name's Steve and I'm an alcoholic. It's been my past, but God help me, it will not be my future. And that's the first step towards rebuilding your broken world and changing your future. I want to encourage you today. If you walked in here today and you are at the point of absolute brokenness, there is hope. If you have had an implosion or something fall apart in your world and you don't know what to do next, God says, I can use that brokenness as the launching pad for true and lasting change. Translation, there's hope for you. There's hope for you. Nehemiah's story begins with brokenness, with grief. But you know what the word The name Nehemiah actually translates to. Nehemiah means the Lord comforts. So let me ask again, what's broken in your world that needs fixing? What breaks your heart? Let's broaden that a minute from the personal to the global, right? Because I know some of you are sitting here and you're like, Tim, there's nothing really broken that seriously in my world that, that, you know, right now. Thank God, right? That's a blessing. That's wonderful. How about the world around you? I want you to think globally for a moment, right? Last few days, you've probably watched the news at some point. And when you look at our broken world, the injustice, the hunger, the poverty, what's broken in our world that breaks your heart? I actually asked that question on social media this week. I just took a little survey to see what you guys would say. And it was like overwhelming, the responses. People said child abuse breaks my heart. Uh, Bullying breaks my heart. I was bullied. I feel so deeply for kids who suffer through that. Um, Broken families were listed. Kids growing up without fathers breaks my heart. I want to do something about that, people said. A lot of people mentioned human trafficking, you know, sexual slavery and evil that needs to be eradicated from our world. Uh, Kids without clean water. Uh, The heroin epidemic. 13 reasons why. A lot of people mentioned teen suicide and depression. Uh, Others said their heart is broken over the state of our nation, right? Our country is so polarized right now. There's no civility. They said the government seems so broken. It seems hopeless. Uh, Others said lost people. People without Christ, people without hope in this world. That breaks my heart. I want to encourage you. If you are here today and there's nothing broken in your personal world right now, open your eyes and don't ignore the larger global burdens because that may be the Holy Spirit speaking to you. If God has placed a burden on your heart, Nehemiah says, I want you to open it up and let it touch yours. Nehemiah lived in Persia. That was a thousand miles away from Jerusalem. 
In other words, it would have been very easy for him to say, oh, I'm so sad to hear the news. Oh, too bad for them. <laughs> he lived in the citadel of Susa. It just means it was the castle of the king. And he could have stayed in his comfortable life of privilege and say, you know what, guys, I'm going to write you a check. Hey, I'll pray for you guys. You know, hopefully God will send somebody to help you out. But guess what? Nehemiah looked at the broken world of people who he loved, and he said, you know what, someone's got to do something about it, and it might as well be me. He saw people suffering on the other side of the world. He said, God, I have a burden, and I want to help fix their world. It reminds me of Bob Pierce, the founder of World Vision, the global charity that sponsors children around the world. Bob Pierce was an ordinary guy traveling through China when a woman approached him and placed an abandoned, battered baby in his arms and said to Bob Pierce, what are you going to do about her? And Pierce was just an ordinary guy. He actually he just rummaged in his pockets. He gave all that he had. He only had a $5 bill. And he said, um, he pledged the woman. He said, I'm going to send you the same amount every month to help care for this one child. And so he did that every month. He sent $5 and then $5 and $5, and God broke his heart for children living in poverty. He said, what if other people sponsored a child for $5? In 1950, he founded World Vision, which now sponsors millions and millions of children, providing food, health care, education, clean water. They now have a revenue of $2.8 billion dollars. They'll just, they'll just rehab like one life. There's families, there's communities, entire nations they're transforming in the name of Jesus. Why? All because some ordinary American guy prayed a dangerous prayer. Bob Pierce prayed, God, break my heart with what breaks your heart. And God lit a fire in Bob Pierce. He poured gasoline on that burden and it literally changed the world through him. If you're like, man, I'd love to be smart of something big. If you're a young person, if you're a millennial and you're like, man, I want to change the world, I dare you to pray this prayer for 52 days. God, break my heart with what breaks yours. If you have a burden, if you have something in your broken world that you're like, man, that needs fixing, don't ignore it. What is it for you? Is it racial injustice, immigration, the the homeless crisis, economic inequality. Don't just whine on social media. Why doesn't anybody care? Why doesn't somebody do something about it? I'll tell you why. God chose you. God gave that burden to you. You didn't chose the burden. The burden chose you. And deep down, if you open your heart, God says, I'll use that misery and turn it into a powerful source of ministry. Listen, am I preaching now? Listen, people, listen. This is how... Your God works. Your biggest burden may be the doorway to your biggest blessing. That's how he works. He takes burdens and turns them into blessings. So who does God use to change a broken world? God uses leaders who will sit down to cry. They will let that pain in their heart. That's the first step according to Nehemiah. The second step we discover is that world changers then kneel down to pray. Let's go. Step number two. Are you ready? Dramatic tension. Let me make sure I get this right. Does that fit? How's that look? Is it lined up? That one I got off a little bit. We'll change it after service. Here we go. Oh, gosh! You thought. They kneel down to pray. After Nehemiah finishes weeping, he prays and he seeks the God of heaven. Look at verse 6. He says this. For some days I mourned and I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, here's his prayer. Listen to his prayer. Lord, the great God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him. Let your ear be what? Attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer that your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. Nehemiah is a leader of deep and committed prayer. He has a a tender heart but he has tough knees. He fights from his knees. This prayer in chapter one of Nehemiah is the first of 12 different mentions of prayer in the book. And and so you're here today and you're like, okay, I can think of what needs fixing, but what can I do? I'm just one little person. We're just one little family. I'll tell you what you can do. You can pray. You can pray day and night upon your father in heaven. Notice that Nehemiah has this like rock solid faith that His father in heaven is loving, that his father cares, that his father is compassionate. In other words, that God is a fixer-upper. And he says, Father, would you just open your, your eyes and your ears to what I'm asking? In other words, 
Nehemiah invites God into his mess. And this is critical. You will never change your world if you don't first take hold of God's strength in prayer. The strongest leaders are praying leaders. And honestly, guys, this is the most neglected step, at least it is in my life. A lot of us, when we see a problem or something that needs fixing, right, we're kind of like, all right, here we go. Give me a hammer. You know, I'll just kind of cover, you know, wallpaper over. But it's folly. <laughs> with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are what? Possible. So I understand you may be looking at this thing and you're like, man, my burden is big, Tim. Here's good news for you today. God plus you always equals a majority. People may tell you this can't be done. You're never going to get out of debt. You're never going to kick that addiction. You're never going to fix that marriage. But God plus you always is a majority. You think, I'm just one person? What can I do? Answer, you can kneel down to pray. Do you notice this is a very humbling position? Nehemiah prays a very humble prayer. Look at verse 6. He says this. Here's his prayer. He says, I, God, I confess the sins that we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. This is a prayer of what? Of confession. And notice something. Nehemiah doesn't say, look at those poor suckers over there. It's all broken down. What a mess they made. He includes himself. He says, I'm a thousand miles away, but I confess the sins we Israelites, including who? Me and my father's family have committed. Even though he lives miles away, he owns his part in the brokenness. See, if you're looking at a mess in your life, you're like, man, I don't know, but what's my part in that? What I found is there's always three sources of brokenness. The first is random, right? It's not your fault. It's what happens when, you know, you're just driving along and all of a sudden somebody runs a red light and they T-bone your car, right? And now you've got a shattered hip and you're like, man, that's, that's just random. It's not my fault. That's one type of brokenness. The second part is where the brokenness is actually your fault. You were the one who were texting while you were driving. And you ran through it, and you didn't mean anything by it, but you made a very bad choice. And now there is a consequence. Your fault. The third one is what I call a combo platter. <laughs> it's both. You may be here, and you're like, man, I'm digging out of debt, Tim, but my company downsized. That's why I lost my job. It wasn't my fault, and it wasn't. But could you say, at the same time, I admit, I overspent for years. I made a lot of stupid credit card choices and just, it contributed. I played a part in the financial mess I'm in. It's a combination. And a bold leader will actually own their part in the brokenness and say, I'm going to come clean before God. I'm not going to rush past this. Because a humble, heartfelt prayer of confession is a foundational step to rebuilding a broken world. Why is this important? Because God opposes the proud. But he gives grace to who? The humble. And Nehemiah humbles himself. He kneels down to pray. We don't know how long, but it wasn't a quickie prayer. It says, for some time, days and night he prayed. And look at the rest of his prayer, verse 10. It says this, these are your servants and your people whom you redeemed, God, by your great strength and your mighty hand. So, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants. In other words, they were all praying, who delight in revering your name. And when Nehemiah stood up, he had the power of God behind him. You're going to see the impact in the weeks to come. It's amazing. Through Nehemiah's prayerful leadership, something that should have taken years, some historians say decades, took Nehemiah how long? 52 days. Through an ordinary humble leader, God performed a fixer-upper miracle. He rebuilt an entire nation. Never forget, guys, when you pray, you tip the odds in heaven's favor. With man, it's impossible, but with God, anything is possible. And you plus him always equals a majority, amen? So to close, I want to ask you this question. What's broken in your world that needs fixing? I know what that is for me, you know? People sometimes ask, and I appreciate this. They say, you know, Tim, you pray for us all the time. Uh, you know, what, what, how can I pray for you? And so I was like, you know what, let me take a minute to answer that. Um, because my burden, like, like what's your, my burden? It, it, this isn't a metaphor. It's a real construction project. It's finishing construction on our Persephone campus. You guys know this. For the last two decades, we have been pursuing, building the broadcast campus in Parsippany, where we're going to relocate 
to be our new headquarters. It's been an amazing journey. Like, I've seen the power of prayer up close all through this over the last two years. The building itself is a miracle. It's a 125,000 square foot warehouse in an ideal location. The crossroads of 80, 287, 10, you know, 46, and that's the power of prayer. Uh, the zoning board uh, approval shows you the power of prayer. We had nine variances that were unanimously approved in 45 minutes. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> And the renovation of the building has been incredible to watch. You want to see a little bit of it? This is kind of fun. This is not like a fake hard hat. I put my hard hat on this week to go downstairs. The walls are up in the sanctuary. This is the sanctuary. You can see it's in a massive auditorium. 22-foot walls. That's the stage. That's where we'll have the camels for the Christmas cantata. No, just kidding. Um, but it's been amazing to see the progress here. Uh, as you walk through, um, they laid the carpet in Liquid Kids last week, uh, installed televisions, in our church, the mini-put television, it's a real church now. Uh, you know, we even, this is a great moment. We even got shiplap in the church, people. We got shiplap. Come on, that's awesome. Isn't that cool? Um, on, uh, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday, some of the equipment for our special needs gym arrived. So we got, yeah, we started assembling the slide, the swings. I tested it out just to make sure it all works. The slide works. Parents, it's safe. Uh, the bathrooms are in. The, uh, the, no, no, that's enough. That's probably enough. The toilets work. Just trust me on this one, all right? Um, really excited to see the completion. Our contractor said we're two to three months away from finishing the project. And, and that's, been a, that's been a burden. I'm like, the ball is on the 10-yard line. And this is a game changer, guys, for us as a church. This represents the future. What, what we're trying to do here is we're going to be able to broadcast live the services on Sunday to all of our campuses so we're all on the same page and launch dozens of new campuses to saturate the state over the next 20 years. But that's been my burden. And, and as we've prayed through this, guys, we've just seen God. When we got our temporary certificate of occupancy and, and a few weeks ago and the staff moved into our office, that was the power of prayer. If you came to our open house, you saw how blessed we are. All the donated furniture, we had donated artwork. That's the power of prayer. But now we're in the home stretch. And my prayer, my burden is literally like every day I'm on my knees. God, would you complete Parsippany for the glory of Jesus and the good of your people? Because we're two or three months away, and we need your help to take the ball from the 10-yard line, get it into the end zone. And if you're like, Tim, you're, man, you're like passionate about this. Yeah, you know why? You know what fuels me? Big building doesn't fuel me. Let me show you a picture of what fuels me. Rick DeVogel fuels me. Rick was baptized here last Sunday in Morristown, soon to be Parsippany. Baptized over 100 people this spring. Amazing. But Rick's story in particular just, just touched my heart. He, uh, he wrote this. He said, in May 2014, I was diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer. And I can't tell you how much it's meant to be part of a, a group, a small group, and the support they provided made such a difference in how I handled that diagnosis. I'm not afraid of dying now. As I know, I'll be with Jesus, and you will all be jealous. <laughs> I, love, I love that. He said, earlier this year through the series Freeway, I learned the best way to follow Jesus is to imitate him and forgive others because that's what Jesus did for me. So I flew to Arizona to meet my natural father who abandoned me 50 years ago and forgive him. I got more than expected. My father said he's been praying and hoping for the phone to ring and me be on the other side for a long time. A weight was lifted off me by finally forgiving my natural father for what he did so many years ago while still honoring my stepfather who did an amazing job raising three boys. It is through the grace and love and forgiveness of Christ that I've decided to get baptized today. Does that move your heart? That moves my heart. This is why I have a burden to see Parsippany completed. I'm like, I will give every ounce of my energy, every inch of my being to see more and more people like Rick devote their whole lives to Jesus Christ. Guys, we have 9 million people in our state. We have your friends, your family, your neighbors who have never tasted the love and forgiveness of Christ. And we got this limited time on earth and I want to see the gospel saturate our state or die trying. Amen? Are you with me? I need your help. Yeah, praise God. Listen, listen. Okay, okay, come back, come back. Listen. I, I was like, I need to apologize to you guys because I, don't, I, I have not been bold enough asking you to pray daily for this. 
See, at key junctures over the last two years, I have, I, I've asked our prayer teams, we have like these prayer warriors who are like, they're amazing people, and I email them, I'm like, we have a big meeting coming up, it's got to pass this inspection, and boom, it does, we've seen breakthrough after breakthrough, but I realize I send out the bat signal to our prayer teams, but I haven't asked you. I have not asked you. And so guys, for the next 52 days, I want to ask you, would you pray with me? Because if we're going to move into our new church home this summer, we need every single person, every single family, at every single campus praying to get the ball across the goal line. This construction project has to be a victory for our whole church, for the glory of Christ and our, our whole state. And I know this is a big ask. You're like 52 days. But I want to ask you, would you commit to pray with me for 52 days for the completion of Parsippany? And if you will pray with me for 52 days, I promise our ministry team will pray with you. In fact, in your uh, program today, we put a prayer card. looks like this. Would you pull that out? Everyone just pull this out, all our campuses. On the front, it says Fixer Upper. And you'll notice on the back, it says, What's broken in your world that needs fixing? Describe it below in one or two sentences so we can pray for you this week. So I want you to fill this out right now. We gave you a pen. Can everyone click their pen? Go ahead. Click, 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 click. Here we go. We're going to click the pens. Would you just... In one or two sentences, or even just a phrase, tell us how we can pray for you. This is anonymous, okay? So you can be as honest and, like, candid as you want, but we're going to pray specifically for your request. Maybe you're like, it's my marriage. Maybe you're like, I'm rebuilding my financial world. Or there's a relationship that needs renovation. Or somebody that you love is lost. It breaks your heart. Write it down. Maybe it's a global burden. You know, maybe it's like, man, the poor or immigration. Just take a minute, write down your request and describe your burden. I'm just going to write, Father, help us complete Parsippany this summer. I've prayed this prayer thousands of times. The good of your people. The glory of Jesus. On the, on the bottom of the card, notice there's a checkbox, and it says, yes, I'll pray alongside Pastor Tim for 52 days for the completion of Parsippany. If you would be willing, guys, to pray alongside me and our team for the next 52 days, it would mean the world to us. It would mean the world. Because, guys, this is not just, it's not just any house. This is God's house. You know what Psalm 127 says? Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. So we need the Spirit's power to accomplish this church. In a moment, our ushers are going to come forward, and you're going to drop your prayer card into the popcorn bucket at your campus and um, know that this week, our ministry team, we're going to pray specifically for you and your burden. We don't want you to carry it alone. We're here to help. But guys, I don't want to carry the burden alone. I don't want just a few people at our church to be carrying it and pushing it. I want our whole church to be praying this so people say, man, that is the power of God at work in the people of God. Amen? Nehemiah is a book of hope. <laughs> Nehemiah begins with brokenness, but it leads to a new beginning, as we'll see next Sunday. Next week, you're going to see how Christians who change the world, don't just sit down and weep, don't just kneel down to pray, they actually stand up to act decisively. After Nehemiah sat down, after he prayed, he took action, very decisive, bold action. You're like, what did he do? What did Nehemiah say? Find out next week in our next episode of Fixer Upper. Are you ready? <laughs> Guys, I pray, you know, I think you feel my passion. I pray that this series is just going to stir something up in every single one of you, you know? And over the next few weeks, God's you're going to get a burden, it's going to touch your heart, and you're going to get to praying, and your life in our world will never be the same. We believe God still moves mountains, amen? God wants to use some of you to change the world. So don't ignore it. Your biggest burden may be the doorway to your biggest blessing. Maybe you had that burden for a long time, and you ignored it, you kind of pushed it away. This is a moment to stand up and act. So you come back next Sunday and you'll learn how. But this week, we're going to lay the foundation together in our small groups. Sit down to cry, share your heart in your small group, and then kneel down to pray together. Whatever brokenness you're facing, just invite God into that mess and watch him just do something amazing. He will turn that mess into a message of his power and grace. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Bow our heads, all our campuses. Father, right now, I come before you. We're going to be handing in these prayer cards, and it's a piece of our heart. There are painful situations that we don't feel hope for. Holy Spirit, breathe on these now. As we place them on an altar before you, we need the power of God to flow in. We need the power of God to heal broken families, to do a miracle work, to tenderize a hard heart in a marriage, 
God, break down those walls and then build them up again. Father, I pray hope right now for parents who are worried about their children. Lord, I thank you for Rick DeVogel, people who, are, who might feel that they're without hope. But Father God, even with someone with stage four cancer can say, I trust in the Lord God Almighty. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we pray for the things that are in our world that break our heart, but we know they break yours. Father, I pray for the kids without clean water, the global dif difference, Lord, that we're making. Just extend those efforts, God. I pray that there would be millennials today who you're lighting a fire in them. And they're going to be a world changer in their generation. And God, I pray right now, we pray for this church, our church, God. It's your church. Lord, would you complete the good work you've begun. Complete Parsippany. Lord, not for our benefit, but for the global glory of Jesus Christ. We want to saturate our state with the good news of Jesus. So, Father, help us with the inspections. Protect us in our construction as we complete the good work. And people see Jesus high and lifted up. It's in his name we pray. Everyone said together. Amen. Amen.